All right, so welcome to episode 12. And uh, what we're going to do is there is a kind of spontaneous and unscripted section where I uh, actually bring up the core module in the back plane and sort of get the circuit w working in its more permanent form. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the construction of both the core module and the back plane PCB. Uh, and then I'll talk about where we're going to go next. All right, let's get started. All right, so uh, this is going to be an extremely uh, spontaneous and unscripted video. And essentially what I want to do is document um, bringing up the this core module for my 6809 uh, com uh, microcomputer circuit uh, on this uh, proto board connected to my passive backplane. So the passive backplane PCBs arrived. Uh, they seem to be okay as far as I can tell. Uh, I have wired up the core circuit uh, CPU glue and glue logic uh, on this proto board uh, and uh, lots and lots of wires, lots and lots of point-to-point uh, -point soldering, but it seems to uh, be okay. Uh, and uh, right now I am trying to verify that the uh, the core module works with the CPU in free run mode. So essentially I've got the data buffer and the address buffers installed. Um, uh, these uh, jumpers are heading off onto the spreadboard and then I have some resistors that have uh, the data bus lines um, wired to hex uh, 1, 2, which is the NOP uh, opcode for the 6809. And then uh, these uh, pins here are the low eight uh, address lines and I'm gonna uh, check those out on my logic analyzer. So in theory right now uh, the CPU is running in free run mode. So uh, let's check out the logic analyzer and see if that's actually happening. All right so here we are in pulse view so uh, I'm pressing reset so let's uh, capture um, the the low eight address lines and see what we see. Okay, so it uh, looks like we did capture some data, so uh, let's take a look at it. Um, okay, and I, I do have the uh, parallel bus uh, decoded here. So uh, broadly, this looks fine. Um, we're, we're fetching, uh, you know, hex one, two, and then the program counter is uh, continuing to fetch NOP uh, op codes at increasing addresses, and so we see hex one two, hex one three, hex one four, hex one five, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why we're seeing uh, these kind of glitch values FF and seven F um, between uh, the valid address values, but uh, this may just be that the um, the address lines aren't necessarily valid, um, other than when uh, sort of the bus cycle proper is taking place so that that is not necessarily a problem so um we'll, we'll see uh so far this looks reasonable all right so here is a debugging technique i can definitely recommend is that if you have a power supply that has an amp reading um keep an eye on what, what it's telling you as you are testing your circuit and so right now i can see that my free run circuit is drawing about 130 milliamps. And based on my prior experience with the uh, prototype circuit on uh, breadboards, that is about right. And so the fact that it's not drawing too much current, you know, it makes me, you know, have some confidence that I haven't, you know, miswired things and I don't have any uh, short circuits or other kinds of uh, uh, oddities. So, so this is giving me a little bit of uh, confidence that things are working uh, as they should. Okay, so just a, a quick update. I'm retesting the free run circuit again this morning um, using the logic analyzer. And this morning I'm getting a nice clean trace including the FE and FF values that we expect to see when the 6809 fetches its reset vector. And then we get the expected counting pattern uh, given that the uh, address bus is just having hex one two asserted onto it. And so this is the program counter counting up as it fetches subsequent NOP instructions. So uh, I'm not sure exactly why we were seeing those uh, glitch values yesterday, but this is, uh, th this is good news. It, it does seem that the, uh, the core module is working correctly. This is Ed. Ed just stole my chair. All right, so I got my chair back, and what I am doing now is I have the data bus lines and the address bus lines uh, going onto the spreadboard, and I am in the process of wiring up this ZIF socket so I can put uh, the EEPROM in there. And basically what I would like to do is verify that we can execute instructions out of the ROM. Uh, okay, let's keep, uh, keep working on that. 
Okay, so the ROM is completely wired in and I have programmed it with a very simple program that uh, starts up, uh, when it jumps into the entry point, writes a byte to the, a non-existent output port, and then goes into a tight loop. And so I've got the um, logic analyzer connected to the low eight address lines. And essentially what I wanna see is evidence that it's fetching the correct reset vector and then uh, going into the loop. Uh, as expected. So, okay, I'm pressing reset. So let's see if we can capture some data here. Actually, um, let me get the logic analyzer set up correctly. All right, so here we go. All right, so we got some data there. That seems promising. Um, yeah, and it looks like we've got the correct initial uh, pattern with the FE and then the, uh, the FF being fetched. So that's uh, decent evidence that the reset vector is being fetched appropriately. Uh, let's see if I can get in on this data here. Okay, good. So uh, we see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, those are basically bytes being fetched from uh, the ROM uh, at the entry point. Uh, and then the loop um, basically starts, I think this, uh, I'm not exactly sure what this FF00 is. Um, uh, this loop here that starts at 5 um, goes 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, 11, 12, 13, uh, and then uh, comes back to address 5. So that is, in fact, uh, the top of the loop. So I think we are uh, I think we are looking at success here for executing some code out of the ROM. So that's great. I'm going to now um, let, wire in a uh, static RAM, and, and let's see if we can uh, get back to where we were last time. All right, so here we are. After a, a ton of wiring, I have the... Uh, the static RAM in here, it's actually hard to see, but it's uh, un un under these wires. I also have a uh, 748CT574 uh, um, octal latch that I'm using as an output port. This is basically a recreation of the same circuit we saw last time with the ROM and the RAM and the output port, and I do have the little hex display here. It's running exactly the same program as before, and as far as I can tell, it seems to be working. So uh, essentially, this is the same circuit that we saw last time, but now uh, the CPU and the glue logic is all on this core module board, and the signals are routed through the backplane, and uh, everything's, uh, well, the, the ROM and the RAM and the output port are still on, on the breadboard. Uh, but yeah, this is this is really good progress. So uh, what one thing uh, to address here is that, you know, clearly this is just an insane, you know, rat's nest of wires. Uh, however, uh, you know, the next module that I will build to put onto the backplane will include both the ROM and the RAM. And most of these wires are simply not going to be necessary for other devices, uh, things other than the ROM and the RAM. Essentially, uh, most of the peripheral devices, you know, will only need a few address lines. And so we're, we're not gonna have this insane rat's nest uh, so much in the future. We should be able to get a lot of that uh, sort of out of the way onto a, a different module. So uh, yeah, this is, this is pretty awesome. Hey, uh, one thing I wanted to mention while we're here is that uh, the idea for the passive backplane uh, and the idea for these little hex displays that I like to use, uh, both of those come from Quinn Dunkey's Veronica project. Uh, I will put a link to it down uh, in the video description, but uh, you should definitely uh, check out her work if you're interested in these 8-bit uh, computer projects. Okay, well, now that things seem to be working, uh, let, let me talk a little bit about the construction of the core module. And, um, you know, ba basically, it's just built on one of these uh, 9 by 15 centimeter uh, one pad per hole proto boards. Um, I really actually don't like these one pad per hole boards. I think they're uh, pretty much a complete pain to work with, but it, it was okay. So essentially, I uh, kind of laid out the uh, IC sockets, you know, for um, based on where I wanted the ICs to go. Uh, I did most of the wiring on the top side. I know a lot of people to wire exclusively on the uh, the back. Um, personally, I, I find that to be a uh, unnecessarily confusing and difficult. So uh, I kind of treat uh, these uh, pad per hole proto boards uh, a little bit like they were uh, breadboards. You know, basically I try to get the wires close to the pin that the pin that the uh, wire is going to connect to. And then I just kind of bend the wire on the other side and solder it to the pin. And 
uh, that that's the primary way of kind of making connections. Um, so, you know, it all worked out. Um, Let's see. So uh, I got most of the signals routed on the top. Uh, I did route some signals on the back. So uh, data bus, and then these are the uh, chip enable signals generated by the two uh, three to eight decoders that uh, generate the chip enables for I/O devices. And uh, I, there was it just wasn't really feasible to do those on the uh, um, on the front. So I did them on the back. Uh, you can see I did uh, all of the decoupling capacitors. Uh, on the back, and I used a little bit of uh, heat shrink tubing to uh, try to insulate the leads uh, to try to avoid, you know, shorting to uh, all of these uh, conductive pads and wires on the back. So it, it all kind of worked out. Um, after I got uh, all of the uh, connections made, I, I sat down with the unpopulated board in the schematic and uh, continuity tested everything, literally every single pin to make sure that uh, all the connections were routed properly. And I actually did find uh, a couple of uh, unconnected um, you know, parts of the circuit and, and, and fix them at that point. So uh, more or less, when I started to add uh, components, uh, things actually worked, which is uh, uh, pretty cool. So one quick thing I wanted to mention about the uh, core module board is uh, specifically the wires I used for uh, the connections on the top side. Um, I used a, a thinner wire than I normally use for breadboard circuit construction. So on a breadboard, I use uh, AWG22 uh, wire, which is uh, pretty thick and makes a better connection in the uh, in the holes on a solderless breadboard. Uh, this is AWG26, so it, it's considerably thinner, and in general, it's a lot easier to work with when you have, you know, fairly uh, fairly dense wiring where there's a lot of wires in in the same area. So uh, that that actually worked out uh, quite nicely. It was also easier to work with on the uh, the back of the board when I actually had to sort of bend a wire and connect it to a pin. Uh, it, it that wound up being being um, a, a little bit easier because the wires were thinner and easier to kind of bend into place. So, uh, so that worked out well. I'm going to uh, continue to use the thinner wire for the, uh, the other circuit modules as well. So there were two uh, aspects of the circuit where I wasn't ready to make a final decision about um, sort of how the connection should be made. One of them was right here. Uh, these three pins, two, three, and four of the CPU are the interrupt input pins. And, and I'm not yet ready to support uh, interrupts. Uh, and so what I did is I uh, basically wired those pins of the CPU to the uh, these three um, pin headers. And then I, I wired up this little three pin socket connector uh, and just uh, wired all the pins together and then tied them all to five volts. So right now, uh, all of those interrupt inputs are tied high uh, and thus disabled. Uh, eventually, I will be supporting at least some hardware interrupts. Uh, another uh, place where I didn't really want to commit myself was on the specific crystal. I didn't want to solder uh, a crystal in. And so I actually um, put in a, uh, a two pin uh, socket connector here that's connected to the uh, placed uh, in the circuit where the um, leaves of the crystal go. Uh, and then uh, for my actual crystal oscillator, I just uh, soldered it to a, a, a two, uh, two pin connector uh, and it can just kind of plug into the socket and I could do that with other crystals and uh, plug other ones in. Um, I'm, I don't know if this is a great idea, but it does seem to work and does give me the option of using other crystals later on. All right, so here's the backplane PCB. There's not a huge amount to say about it. It essentially has uh, places where you can populate uh, up to seven two by 40 pin headers. Uh, I'm using male pin headers, and I was a little worried initially that I wouldn't get good mechanical stability when the uh, PCBs with their female connectors are plugged in here, but in fact, it's perfectly fine. Uh, it's quite rigid. Um, so uh, other things you can see here, there's a little prototyping area. Eventually, I'm going to put a ZIF socket for a ROM here. Uh, I can't really put a ZIF socket on uh, one of the actual PCBs, and I definitely want uh, the ZIF socket for easy, you know, ROM insertion and removal as I do firmware development. Um, 
So that'll go here. Uh, this pin header is not really for um, for a PCB. It's just for access to backplane signals, so that I can you know sort of plug wire you know jumper wires in here as I develop things on breadboard as I'm prototyping new parts of the circuit. Um, power distribution uh, sort of goes to these really thick traces uh, up here. Uh, there's also a couple down here that that I could use for for power distribution. Um, there was originally a, a place for a screw terminal here. Uh, the screw terminals I have I got from eBay and they're basically terrible. Uh, the one that I had on here broke, so I've just got a couple of uh, uh, wires soldered directly to the board for now, but that, yeah, that's okay. Um, I have an electrolytic capacitor here for a little bit of bulk um, power, supp power supply decoupling and then, and then an LED uh, so I can tell when power is uh, available. So uh, basically this thing has worked out quite well. Uh, so hopefully it'll continue to, to work well as uh, new components are added to the, to the circuit. All right, so I mentioned that I'm, I'm not a big fan of the one pad per hole proto boards. Uh, I did build the core module on on one, but um, it's really not my favorite uh, type of proto board for uh, circuit construction. So I found these really, really nice um, 10 by 15 centimeter proto boards on eBay uh, that are basically an IC pattern. So you can see that they're basically sort of groups of uh, five holes that are all electrically connected. And then there are some, uh, you know, some bus connections uh, for, for power distribution. Uh, and these are quite nice. And there's even this sort of uncommitted uh, row of, uh, of single holes down here at the bottom, which means that um, my uh, uh, 2 by 40 female connector that the bottom row um, isn't, uh, you know, sort of compromised by uh, sort of having, you know, both, uh, both pins that are adjacent vertically in the same group of uh, you know, the same group of holes that are electrically connected, which would obviously be a problem. So, so these are, you know, more or less perfect for my application. And they, uh, they take the, uh, the, the, the two by 40 female connector, um, you know, just fine. So, so basically all of the future modules, I bought a bunch of these, uh, all of the subsequent modules are going to be constructed uh, on these. So, so the, this is going to be the next module in the circuit. And, uh, I want to put the ROM on here, uh, RAM, um, and then uh, basically some other peripheral devices. And the ones that I'm thinking about are uh, specifically um, an 82C55A uh, GPIO um, uh, chip, uh, basically for some GPIO pins. Um, I'm also going to add a timer counter, the uh, 82C54, and also a UART for serial communications, uh, specifically uh, the 63B50. Um, and uh, th this board should accommodate all of those. And maybe even um, a uh, UART to uh, USB connector. So uh, that will allow me to basically uh, connect to the uh, the target system, you know, the 6809 system, uh, using a, a terminal program running on the host PC. So, uh, so that's what uh, what this board is going to be. All right, so uh, let's talk about what's going to happen next. So basically, I need to uh, construct the next uh, hardware module that will have the ROM and the RAM on it, but will also have uh, some peripheral devices on it. And uh, I might actually start by prototyping those on a, on a breadboard, but they will go on the second hardware module. Um, once the system has some actual useful hardware devices, then it's going to make sense to start developing some uh, firmware for it. And, uh, you know, basically I want something like kind of a basic ROM monitor that will allow us to uh, boot the system up, interact with it, you know, maybe load code into RAM and execute it, things like that. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we should have more for you soon. All right. See you next time.